so nice to see so many of you, and I, I think there are maybe two or three young people have brought the average age down about six months, so <laughs> that's exciting. Um, this is the 29th Jewish Book Month opening event, 29 years. And I think there are some 10-year-olds in the audience who helped get it started 29 years ago. So um, we're, we're thrilled. I think we have an exciting speaker tonight. Um, this all comes off, as you know, uh, the horrors of last weekend, and it has to be mentioned, and hopefully um, they're going to continue to mention it, and we're going to continue to fight for the truth and to support Israel and to be there as best we can, to make donations if you're able. Um, our Jewish homeland is under brutal <coughs> and savage attack. And I know everyone is moved and upset, and um, some of you may have family there. It, it is devastating. So being together and being supported by the people at your table, the people around you, it's good. I, I, I feel that comfort and support to be with a Jewish audience. So I ask you for uh, a few seconds, half a minute of, of silence for those that perished and for those that are on the front line. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we cannot be deterred, and I, I'm thrilled that we're here together. Um, as you know, uh, you may not know, there were threats made nation or, or uh, uh, worldwide threats that tomorrow is a day that uh, Jewish targets will come under attack. I think it's just talk, frankly, but obviously it makes a lot of people nervous. Um, but we cannot stop doing and letting our lives be dictated by some maniacs overseas. So again, it's great that we're here. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday, and I'm gonna ask Helene Hazlett to come up for a second. This isn't only the fight of the Jewish community. This is the fight of humanity in the civilized world. And the Jewish community being as small as it is here and around the world needs allies and people that will speak up and support our community in these dark days. So we are planning a program, I want Helene just to mention for a little bit, a little plug. Good evening, everyone. Um, it, it is a sad time, and I want to tell you, not only have we all gathered together uh, in spirit and, and, and hope and sadness, but the interfaith community is very sad and very s supportive. I've gotten just as many emails and texts from my non-Jewish friends as I have, as we've been talking to each other th these past five days. So tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, I apologize, Sunday night, October 15th, at the Star of the Sea Church, that's across the street from the Marblehead Police Station, there's going to be a interfaith program. And it's gonna begin at three o'clock. If anybody heard that it was 4.30, forget that, because the church is having a program at 5, so we have to honor what their, what their program is also. So 3 o'clock, an interfaith gathering at the Star of the Sea Church across from the Marblehead Police Station, where the park is, you know, where the, they play, play field hockey, baseball, whatever else they play. So um, hope you can come, and uh, I think you will feel the spirit and the the warmth of the entire community. So see you there. Thank you. So let's uh, the program begin. And moving on, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the chairs of uh, Jewish Book Month, Patty McQueeny, and uh, maybe the chair this evening, Izzy Abram. Hi, everybody. I'm Patty McQueenie, and I'm honored to um, serve as co-chair of this year's Jewish Book Month. Sil Sylvia Belkin uh, is my co-chair. And I think it's fair to say that Sylvia and I did not expect to open this year's series under these circumstances. But here we are. 
And yet, here you are. Thank you so much for coming out. It, as Marty said, we're thrilled to see you here. So very happy. Um, we have a fabulous lineup this year, right out of the gate. We have a big time author, so we're very excited about that. Izzy will uh, introduce him. And as you may know, the JBM series has many moving parts, and fortunately, many supporters. Let me start by thanking Sharon and Howard Rich. Where are you? <laughs> our, our cultural benefactors, and also our many sponsors. So together with Shan Sharon and Howard and the sponsors, we have a strong and solid foundation that helps us tremendously. And while I'm at it, let me not forget to mention the tireless, talented, and devoted committee members. These are the people who carry the water, get the job done, and bring each of these events to life. So thanks to all of you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Couple quick things. First, E.B. Horn has donated a pair of beautiful diamond earrings. I checked them out. They're beautiful. And you can have them. They can grace your ears or a loved one's ears if you win the raffle. But like the Schlemiel who asked God to help him win the lottery, you got to buy the ticket. You're not winning without a ticket, so do yourself a favor, buy some tickets. After the talk, you can buy the book from Copper Dog Books over there, who has been partnering with us at these events for many years, so that would be great. Thank you again for joining us tonight, perhaps now more than ever. And now for the main event. Here's Izzy, who of course in this crowd needs no introduction to introduce our author. Thanks and enjoy. Good evening. Um, I just want to add one thing to what you said, Patty. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have with us the director of the Swampscott Library, Jonathan Nichols, who I work with. And they are co-sponsoring this with us. Um, and you've really been so helpful, Jonathan, to help make this work. So. William Landy, we all know the name, don't we? Yeah. Do we remember Defending Jacob? Yes. yes, and we could even see it on the screen, couldn't we? Who's seen it? Okay, all right. I'll, we'll ask them later how they, how they did on that. But Bill Landy is here um, to discuss his new book, All That Is More Than I, can, I Carry With Me and he also wrote three previous novels, The Defending Jacob, which won the Strand Critics Award for Best Mystery Novel, The Strangler, listed as a Best Crime Novel of the Year by the LA Times, The Daily Telegraph, and others, and Mission Flats, winner of the Dagger Award for the Best Crime Novel. A former district attorney, he lives in Boston, and he also happens to be <laughs> the son-in-law of this wonderful woman named Honey, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight with Jerry, and many of you know this couple in our community, but if it hadn't been for Honey, I don't know if Bill Landy could be our opening book tonight, and so I welcome him up and join with me to uh, say, hey, come on and entertain us. Talk to us. It's all yours. Well, thank you. I would have come even without uh, Honey Doctoroff's intervention. Um, I do think it's appropriate to pick up on what was said earlier. This is a somber uh, moment for uh, all of us and for our community. And there is a feeling uh, that it may not be appropriate to, okay. 
Uh, there's a feeling at times like this that it may not be appropriate to talk about art uh, or entertainment. Uh, but I would suggest to you that this is the time when we really should be. Um, after 9-11, uh, Ian McEwan wrote, uh, the novelist, uh, wrote an essay in which he said that uh, the terrorists who flew the planes into those buildings could not have done so uh, if they could imagine what it was like to be inside those buildings. It was a failure of empathy. And I would suggest to you that when we read novels, we are training ourselves in the skill of empathy. We are practicing uh, the experience of the world through the eyes of another. We assume the identity of another and we step into their shoes and we see what it is like to experience the world as they do. And that makes us uh, more humane uh, and more merciful. We are learning to be moral uh, by doing that. So at a moment like this especially, uh, when we need to hang on to our humanity uh, and not give in to uh, hate and to dehumanizing others, uh, I would suggest to you that uh, reading novels is, is, is great practice and great training uh, in morality. Uh, Writing novels, not so much. That's <laughs> pure suffering. Um, so you mentioned Defending Jacob, and, and this book really is a continuation uh, of the direction uh, I felt I was headed in uh, with Defending Jacob. Uh, this whole, we were speaking earlier, uh, <laughs> we were speaking earlier about how my, uh, I feel like I've spoken to half of you already. Um, <laughs> and feel free to throw your hand up, whatever. This is a conversation. I'm, I hate giving speeches. Uh, but I'm happy to have a conversation. Uh, we spoke earlier about how I got started in this, and I was a, uh, a young lawyer, and um, I was writing nights and weekends. I just, it was just something I did as a hobby and as a compulsion, and I wanted to see if I could write a novel, uh, just one. Uh, and it really, I had never aspired to uh, become a novelist. I didn't uh, know any such people. Uh, I, there were no artists uh, or creative people at all, really, uh, in my life growing up. It didn't seem to me to be a career choice. Uh, it is still not a career choice <laughs> that I would <laughs> recommend. It's not a proper career. Uh, but so I set out to, to write that one book. Uh, I was an assistant DA in Middlesex County at the time, and, and at the beginning it was easy enough to do because your cases are uh, brief and, and the stakes are low. As you climb the ladder, however, uh, your trials become all-consuming, the stakes get very high, and you become involved with uh, families uh, of victims as you are trying these cases, uh, and you no longer have the, the time uh, to, to invest in your books as you would like to. Uh, so I wound up leaving the DA's office, taking what I call the leave of absence, uh, to see if I could write uh, that one book. Uh, I struggled with that for a couple of years. Uh, I, uh, in the interim, uh, got married to Honey's daughter, uh, <laughs> which was easy enough uh, to do. Getting married, I found, didn't really uh, change much of anything. Uh, but then we got pregnant. And that suddenly, uh, being an unpublished author, uh, seemed unsustainable. Uh, and I was ready to go back to the law at that point. Uh, at, we were at the uh, obstetrician's office to hear uh, the baby's heartbeat. And uh, it, that was when the call came in uh, from my agent, uh, telling me that we had sold the first book. Uh, and not only did we sell the first book, which would have allowed me to check off my bucket list item and move on, but I got a two book contract. Uh, so the downside of a two book contract is you have to write the second book. <laughs> so at that point I was, uh, my background was uh, in criminal law and that seemed like a way to uh, break in. I had uh, in churning, uh, novels earlier, and I, I'm self-taught. I've never uh, taken a course or anything like that. So it was always just me writing uh, for myself. Um, and so I wrote about uh, the exquisite 
angst of being Bill Lande. Uh, you'll be shocked to hear that there's very little audience for that. Um, and it, it dawned on me very late that if I did in fact want to publish a novel, I had to write to the market, I had to write to a genre. And so naturally enough, I chose to write about crime. Uh, I have to say, I don't um, consider myself uh, a crime novelist. I don't find crime uh, itself all that interesting. I certainly don't find criminals uh, that interesting. One thing you uh, can't miss uh, when you work at a prosecutor's office is the sameness of crimes, the routine of it, uh, how uh, similar the cases become. Uh, so the idea of their uh, being criminal geniuses uh, who, uh, who bear the sort of attention that uh, a novel length treatment uh, uh, demands uh, is just not realistic. It doesn't map to reality. Uh, and so there's a falseness about crime novels to me uh, that I was fine with at the beginning. Uh, and I, my first couple of books are traditional crime novels uh, in the sense that they're about street crime. Uh, they're written in what, uh, what passes for me as kind of a hard-boiled tone. Uh, if any of you have read any of my books, you know that they're not especially hard-boiled in tone, but I was doing the best I could. Uh, and when it came time to write the third book, um, I uh, proposed to my editor uh, another uh, pretty traditional crime novel. And what she told me was, come down to New York and we'll discuss it. And so, of course, I said, oh, shit, because <laughs> they don't tell you to come down to New York if it's good news. So I went down and uh, we ate at the, in the, we met in the Random House dining room, which tells you about how long ago this was. There used to be such a thing. Uh, it was in their office, it looked over uh, Broadway, there were waiters in white coats, and we were the only ones in this whole place. And what she had brought me down to tell me was that uh, you can write another uh, traditional crime novel, and this novel was gonna be set in the combat zone. It was gonna follow up uh, The Strangler, which is kind of a LA confidential-ish uh, treatment of the Boston crime world uh, it, during the, the years of the Boston Strangler, uh, and I wanted to follow, follow that up with a book uh, set in the crime world of the 70s in the combat zone, which was, when I was growing up, was kind of a magical, uh, it's like an like a evil brigadoon that would appear at night uh, and then disappear during the day. If you had to go to the registry, you would go into the combat zone, but then at night you couldn't be there. Um, so my editor said, uh, you know, if you write a book set in the combat zone, no matter how good it is, a mainstream readership is just not gonna give it a chance. Uh, most novel readers, uh, non-crime readers, non-suspense readers, uh, just aren't gonna go down that aisle of the bookstore. So what she suggested that I do is write something closer to my own life, closer to my own actual lived experience. And that's how Defending Jacob began. Uh, Defending Jacob is set in Newton, where I live, it posits a family that resembles my own in a lot of ways. Uh, even the minivan that they drive uh, is, the, is the car that we had at the time. Uh, and that was my rule in writing that book. No matter how outlandish the uh, plot twists were, uh, in the details, I was always steering it back to my life, back to uh, my own uh, experience and sensibilities uh, and the feeling was that if I wrote in that sincere way, uh, if I were present in the moment and present in the prose that way, the reader would feel it. Uh, and I do think that there is something to that, that uh, a, uh, a reader comes to a book in a way that's very different from, from the way a writer perceives a book. Uh, to a reader, uh, a book is, is the object that you pick up, it is a finished product, it's a thing. And you read through it from page one to page last, and you follow that roadmap of the story. For a writer, a book is a performance. It is the hours that you spent working on it, and what's left is the book. The book is the artifact of that struggle. And what's captured in those pages 
is the experience that you had while writing them. It's your thoughts. It's your thoughts in the moment of writing. And when you read, when you bring your skill as a reader to it, and you pick those words up off the page, and you perform the book for yourself in your head, then what you are doing is reanimating the feelings of the writer and the thoughts of the writer in that moment, which are there uh, frozen in amber for you to, to re-experience. So that was the feeling, was that if I wrote uh, in, a more, in a more genuine way uh, and in a more um, accessible way to a mainstream readership, then maybe that book could break out. Uh, and it sure did uh, break out. Uh, in fact, that book was that book was a hit before we even hit the public the, the pub date. Um, I, I the biggest tour I have ever done was the pre-publication tour for that one. This was I didn't even know pre-publication tours existed <laughs> until then. Um, so the question after that became, uh, how do you follow up a book like that? And, and that's how All That Is Mine, I Carry With Me, uh, came to be. Um, the idea was to steer even more into the wind. The idea was to steer even closer to your actual uh, lived experience. Um, it becomes difficult when you're writing about crime and are not, in fact, a criminal. Uh, and there are, uh, sadly, uh, no murderers in my family that I can write about, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of uh, autobiography in this book. There's a lot of uh, detail, again, that draws uh, directly from my life. In fact, I will tell you that the, uh, the narrator in book one, uh, whose name is Philip Solomon, the book opens uh, with a narration by uh, a novelist. I will tell you that that uh, writer's name was Bill Lande uh, until the very last edit of the book. And the idea was, again, to merge reality with fiction uh, as much as possible. Um, I have a theory um, that it is harder now than ever uh, for readers to uh, uh, do the basic uh, uh, thing that, that novel readers are asked to do, which is to suspend disbelief uh, in the famous phrase. Uh, you are. Uh, asked to accept as true in the moment uh, a story that you know is not true. It says it's fiction right on the binding, and yet you are asked to uh, accept it as if true. And if you don't, then the novel will be flat. It will not, uh, you won't experience it as a true uh, dramatic experience. Um, nowadays, when there's so much information uh, coming at us, and so much of it uh, is uh, inaccurate, uh, malicious, uh, unreliable, we are taught precisely uh, never to suspend disbelief. We are taught always to have our filters up uh, and our BS detectors on. And we have learned to engage uh, with the world that way. And so when we put down our newspapers, or more likely our phones, uh, and pick up a book uh, and try to engage with it, uh, it's more difficult uh, than ever uh, to, accept, uh, to accept the story as authentic, even if it's not true. Um, so what I wanted to present to the reader in this case was a book that felt so true, uh, that felt so authentic, even if it bordered on memoir, uh, that even skeptical uh, readers, even cynical readers who have a hard time uh, accepting uh, stories on their own terms, uh, even they would have to accept it uh, and buy in. Uh, I think also uh, a way to engage readers, the best way to engage readers who are uh, overwhelmed uh, with text at this point and with news is to present them uh, a text that demands their active uh, involvement. This is not uh, uh, television executives talk about lean back TV. Lean back TV is something like Survivor or uh, reality cooking shows where you sit back and you don't have to think too hard on a Tuesday night when you're tired, you can just lean back and, and chill. Uh, 
I don't think that works as well for novels because of the state of our readership now. And so this book uh, demands more of the reader than that you simply follow along. Um, this book uh, asks you to put together some puzzle pieces. This book uh, throws you off balance with changes uh, in point of view uh, and in time. Uh, it asks you to assemble uh, the puzzle pieces. And that active engagement of the reader, it's my hope, uh, is a way to, um, to trigger that sort of uh, electric experience that we've all f had uh, with, with the best books. Um, you know, we've all had, we're all uh, readers in this room, and we've all had uh, mostly ordinary reading experiences uh, where the book uh, either doesn't come off the page at all uh, or, or comes off imperfectly. Uh, but we've all also had those magical reading experiences uh, where the book genuinely comes alive and it's a vivid uh, electric experience and every writer wants to create that, that unforgettable uh, experience uh, in readers and that's the goal. So that's the goal of a book that is structured uh, in a complex uh, way like this. It trusts the reader uh, and it, uh, it respects the reader because honestly, in, in a lot of other books, uh, you would be spoon fed a lot of the things that uh, here you're asked to, to infer, uh, to deduce for yourself. Um, so, so this is a book that engages you. Um, the plot of the book, uh, is about a, uh, it's about a disappearing woman case. Uh, it, it involves a woman who uh, goes missing in the 1970s. She's a young mom. And it's really about uh, the effect of that disappearance on her children. Uh, uh, she has three children, uh, one of whom is a friend of the author, um, who will remain nameless. Um, this case goes unsolved. Uh, and in that sense, it is a challenge, a book that pushes back against the conventions of the genre as well. Um, the whole point of a crime story is that it must be solved. Uh, we all uh, love the satisfaction of the last scene where uh, the detective assembles the uh, suspects in a room and, and names the guilty one or on TV. Uh, where a, uh, a defendant in court will uh, suddenly confess from the stand or some smoking gun evidence will be produced uh, two minutes before the last commercial break uh, that removes all doubt from the case and gives you a dramatically satisfying close to the story. Um, that quite obviously is not true uh, to, uh, to the experience of, of what, what you see in the criminal courts. Uh, even a guilty conviction, uh, which is supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt, is never beyond all doubt. Uh, and this is the instruction that we give to every uh, jury. Uh, you're not asked to find a defendant guilty beyond all doubt, but only beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so we are willing to tolerate some uncertainty, as we have to be, uh, because in a system populated by human beings, there will always be doubt and there will always be error. And the question is, what is the error rate that we're willing to tolerate uh, and still believe in the system? So I wanted to address that directly, and that, uh, that involves positing a case uh, that doesn't get solved, uh, or if solved, uh, leaves the participants in sufficient doubt uh, that they have to think about even the people closest to them. In some ways, it's the mirror image of defending Jacob, uh, which was about parents looking at their young child and wondering uh, what he's really capable of. This is about uh, children looking up the family tree uh, at their father uh, and wondering uh, what he's capable of. And that is true to all of our experience uh, in growing up. Um, we see our parents uh, in, a <laughs> in, a, in a perfect light. Uh, as children, and then we grow up and we meet them again as fellow adults, and we're more able to perceive their flaws and their personalities, uh, and we're more willing to think about uh, what they might be capable of. And some of the things we learn about our parents we may not admire so much. 
Um, when I say we learn about their flaws, some of those flaws are significant. Um, and just as uh, defending Jacob uh, dramatized to the point that you can't necessarily pick your children, uh, you also can't pick your parents. Uh, and this is, again, um, true to the experience of growing up. And, uh, you know, I said earlier that uh, I don't consider myself a crime novelist, and, and nor do I consider crime inherently uh, all that interesting. My, my books don't have uh, uh, gunfights and, and car chases and, and things like that. Um, to me, crime is interesting only as a prism uh, to look at these more universal uh, things. Uh, in this case, it, this involves a, a criminal case in which a, a husband is suspected uh, of murdering his wife. Um, and I will tell you that I grew up in a, in a house that, that with divorce. And, and you are trying to uh, filter those feelings uh, and that experience uh, through, the, uh, through the mold uh, of a criminal case. Uh, the best uh, uh, explanation of this that I've heard is uh, from a psychiatrist uh, who, who said that, uh, that bad men do what good men dream. And, and that's the beauty of crime novels, is uh, you know, when we read uh, Hamlet or Macbeth, we are experiencing something personal to us. We're experiencing them uh, in a way uh, that more deeply uh, than you, we would expect uh, of a uh, story about a, a Dutch king or a Danish king from the Middle Ages. Uh, or a Scottish uh, lord from the Middle Ages. Um, these stories speak to us because they are crime stories uh, that touch on universal themes. Uh, and that's the goal with this book as well. So I'll leave it there and I'm uh, happy to uh, uh, answer any questions or I know a lot of you are here uh, with questions about defending Jacob. I'm happy to talk about that too. Switching out the mics. Sure. Oh, is this not, was that one? Nobody heard the whole thing? No, back. no, it was, but I don't want to walk around with this one. Um, so I have, first of all, thank you. And I have two questions. The first is, um, did some of the um, ideas in the two books, Defending Jacob and the one we're talking about now, come from your cases? No. Oh, good. Uh, uh, the, can you hear me without the microphone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe that's the better way to do it. Can everyone hear? Everyone hear everybody just speak? Okay. I filled that courtrooms that are bigger than this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the question is whether uh, my books uh, are based on actual cases that I handled, and the answer is no. Uh, and, and the reason, as I say, is that uh, ordinary cases uh, that come through the criminal courts just really aren't that interesting. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and the thing to remember is, even a case that is interesting in the sense of being lurid uh, and, and uh, bloody or gory uh, will not stand up to a novel length dramatic treatment because again, uh, it's not the, the, the bloodiness uh, of it that is the draw, it's the human element. Yeah. And, and the criminals themselves and the motives for their crimes uh, tend not to be complex uh, and they tend not to be original. Uh, so you're looking for stories that catch, uh, and that's what uh, I think that's what every writer wants. But it's particularly what I want, and what I what I wanted with this book, where it's told in such an unorthodox uh, way mm -hmm. and aims to uh, strike a tone of truthfulness. I'm trying to write books that stick in your throat. I'm trying to write books that uh, aren't like the book you read before or the book you'll read after. Uh, and that requires uh, something uh, better than what you're likely to run into uh, in Lowell District Court. Uh, where I started. Uh, although I, if you're hard up for entertainment, I highly recommend Lowell District Court. <laughs> yes, and I'm just wondering what your maybe one or two favorite books, novels are. Uh, favorite books, I always, um, common uh, question, and I have to say, I think of favorite books differently now uh, than when I was simply a reader of books. <coughs> now when I turn to books, uh, I'm often turning to it for help. 
Um, and so favorite books are often books that get me writing. Uh, and that often means uh, uh, books written by, by writers who I think are just great sentence writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you read some of, uh, when, you, when you hear the sound of great prose, uh, it makes you want to write, uh, to me at least. And when you are stuck, uh, that feeling of actually wanting to write uh, is hard to come by. Uh, I've never, uh, we were speaking earlier, uh, about whether I consider myself uh, a writer, uh, and I don't, uh, because to me, it's, it's hard labor, it's breaking rocks. I have never felt uh, instinctive about this. I've never felt like I could just uh, open the floodgates and, and let it come. Uh, so for me, I'm constantly looking for that, uh, that sound and that inspiration. So I turn to writers uh, like Ian McEwen, uh, who I've been working through uh, recently. Uh, John Updike is very good for this. Uh, uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald are, are, are both good as uh, uh, in different ways. Uh, and so often I, I'm turning to books for instrumental reasons. And I have to say it makes it hard for me to enjoy a book in the uh, uncomplicated way that I used to when I was uh, a younger person, and I could just experience uh, 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 books in a simple, in a simple way. I will say a couple of law school classmates here. I will say, I will say that when I was in law school, uh, a, uh, a, a bookish friend of mine uh, and I were reading *Lois and Dove* uh, as we were working our way uh, through law school, uh, and and *Lois and Dove* may be my my. Favorite, favorite book. And yours too? Isn't that funny? Uh, and, and we would have conversations uh, uh, during law school, it was a shock to you, um, in which we said, you know, what is more valuable? What is the more special uh, accomplishment? Uh, would you be uh, a great lawyer uh, and try your cases for years and years, uh, and yet when you walk out of the courtroom, uh, there's nothing left? Uh, even if you win, uh, there's no uh, preservation of your, of your brilliance uh, during those few hours. Uh, or would you be Larry McMurtry, who, who led a life that was difficult in many, many ways, and he struggled, uh, but he left this transcendent work. Uh, and, and what we came to, uh, what I came to, uh, uh, was that I'd rather write uh, and I would, I would give up a lot uh, to write a book like Once and Dove. Uh, so, I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah? I'm curious what your perspective is from the series of Defending Jacob, what liberty you've had into it, and et cetera. Um, the series, everybody, everybody asks about the series because the series made uh, changes to the book. And so I'll tell you that my approach going into it was I, I never wanted to be uh, proprietary or defensive about the book. I thought of the series as a new work in a, in a new medium, and I didn't feel uh, that they had to be faithful to the book at all. In fact, I wanted them to feel free to make whatever changes they, they wanted because of uh, the needs of uh, film are so different uh, from, from the needs of, of a book. <clears throat> Some of the changes I didn't necessarily go along with, and it was a lesson in um, collaboration uh, and, and writing by committee. Uh, at the beginning, there were very few of us involved in it. You would be surprised at, at what a small-scale project uh, that began as and, and how few people uh, were in the kitchen. And as it moves along uh, and, and more people become involved, uh, it becomes a negotiation. And a lot of uh, decisions are made that are driven by uh, concerns <coughs> that have uh, very little to do uh, with what works dramatically. So uh, I'm very happy that it got made. Uh, and it was a, a very fun experience. It's, it's a very strange thing to go to a movie set uh, and see two or three hundred people all supporting this massive project and hear actors reciting the lines that you just wrote while you were sitting in Starbucks one day. So, it's a
it's a, it's a surreal experience. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Yes? I just want to speak to the point you made before. I think it's hard to hear on the other side. Oh. If you don't mind using oh. this. I like to do that. Um, I, I want to speak to the point you made before about reading and the importance of empathy and the fact that we're having all this going on globally. I find reading such a source of, of pleasure to be able to immerse myself in a story like yours and like others. I mean, I'm in several book groups. Mostly yours, <laughs> mostly yours. But it's a point well taken that we can't abandon the arts because it, it, it is our humanity. And that's what we have to propagate with our, with our friends and our family and our children and, 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 and carry on and doing it through reading because it makes us who we are. And, and I do think that that's an, an extremely important point that you make the empathy part and, and the arts and continuing it and not feeling guilty about enjoying a book. Because really when you read, you're enjoying it so much. It's, it takes you to other levels more than any other art form because you, you're, you're with it for such a long, not a long time, but a, a finite time from, from beginning to end. So that, that's what I wanted to say, because yeah. I agree with you. I think that's, I think that's right. I, I, would, I, would, I would take that point even further uh, to say that novels are, are unique among art forms in that uh, they are consumed privately. Uh, there is no performative aspect to a novel. Uh, it's written in uh, solitude, and it is consumed in solitude. Even if you're standing on a crowded subway car reading a book, your experience of that book is an interior one, uh, and, and that makes it the most intimate art form. It is a blending of your consciousness with the writer's consciousness, and, and that makes it an especially uh, uh, internal uh, and demanding art form that uh, requires your active participation in ways that performing arts do not. You cannot sit in a chair and passively observe what's going on. You have to open the book, and, and you have to do the work of pulling those words up off the page. Uh, and it's in that uh, interaction, it's in that synergy uh, between you and the book that something magical happens that takes you out of your experience. Yeah. It, it is in, in you and the book, but it is so wonderful to share your thoughts yes. with other people that sometimes illuminate points that you missed or or you have them and they missed and, and you get different perspectives. Yes. That's the joy of, of the book clubs. That's, that's it. Isn't it great? It is. And, it, and the thing that's so, it's, it's like, it's like uh, a first date or something because you're, you're meeting someone, you have this private uh, interior experience and then you meet someone who loves the book and experienced it in as exhilarating a way as you did. And when you connect on that, you're connecting on such an intimate experience that it, it, it brings human beings together. And that is a, a special sort of bond. So, and this is for the rare book club where people actually read. So, <laughs> so I, I um, uh, when you spoke about meeting the editor at Random House and her cue to you that you really needed to, to look into yourself and be, I wonder. I wondered. Was there something that you discovered about your own self that you, and it may not have been a good thing. I, I don't know that that you might not have discovered had you not been prompted to to take that journey in that fashion. I I I think so, and I hope so. Um, I I don't want to be the sort of writer who cranks out X number of words a day. Uh, I want to be the sort of writer who, who digs deep uh, and who challenges himself uh, in that way. Uh, there, and there's a price to be paid for that, mostly uh, that I can't produce as quickly uh, as other writers will be able to. Uh, but I think that's the point. Uh, 
to me, I, I, this is such a difficult thing to do. Uh, if, if, it, if it isn't personally uh, challenging that way, if you don't uh, feel uh, yourself, uh, if, if you're not putting yourself into the book, uh, it's just not worth it uh, to me. It's just too hard, uh, honestly. There's easier ways to make a living. Um, so I'm sure there are many things uh, that I've learned about myself. Uh, and I think in this latest book especially, because this book is, is so personal uh, and grows so much out of my own experience. Um, my, uh, I have a brother and, and sister who, who read the book uh, who said, you know, there, there's about four people on earth who are going to understand every reference in this book. And I, and I think that's true, but that's how, uh, how personal uh, it became. Uh, and the point isn't uh, to understand every reference. Uh, the point isn't to recognize uh, uh, my grandpa uh, uh, in the book. Uh, the, the point is to feel my presence in the book. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, what great novels uh, can do. Uh, George Orwell has a great uh, essay on Dickens where he says that uh, with the best writers, uh, you have a sense of the writer's face behind the page. Uh, and that's the sense that you that I want to, uh, to give readers, is the sense of my presence uh, inside those words. Uh, and, and, and that's the goal. That's the goal. And it's why I think uh, often readers will come up to me, uh, and, and we're like old friends. Uh, they feel that they know me, uh, because in a way they do. Uh, they've met me in a very intimate way. So I will tell you, by the way, too, uh, uh, <laughs> My, uh, my mother-in-law, Honey, uh, was mentioned earlier. There's a scene in this book where the detectives go to Cleveland uh, to interview a woman who they think uh, uh, might, be, might be the missing woman. And they uh, give her a battery of questions uh, to answer, to, to see whether she's living uh, uh, under an assumed identity. They quiz her uh, on her own uh, biography. The biographical details that I put in there uh, are all uh, honeys. <laughs> that's the hospital she was born in, that's, that's the, the high school she went to. <laughs> so it saved me a lot of research. That's great. Um, I have a, a question, a comment, and then a question. Um, first of all, I think you've accomplished your goal. Um, I'm not a crime book reader, um, but I love the last two books that I've read. Um, and I'm amazed at the way that the crime almost becomes secondary to the relationships and the feelings that, that come through in the books. And that just hooks me right in every time and I'm thinking about them all the time when I'm out walking. My second question is, um, I somehow thought there was something wrong with my book because I couldn't find the quotation marks after a while. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what happened to them. Yeah, but, uh, for those of you who, who haven't read it or may not remember, um, in, I think it's in the last book, of the book, book three, uh, book three, uh, book three yeah. uh, uh, there are no quotation marks around the uh, And the reason for that uh, uh, simply is that it was important that all of these different narrators uh, not only have, have their own voice, uh, but that they have their own syntax, they, they're their writing must even uh, appear uh, visually to be distinctive, so that as you move from voice to voice, you genuinely feel uh, uh, the difference uh, in these perspectives. Um, one of the things that is interesting about reading uh, as, as, a, as an art form is that you first encounter uh, the, the page visually. Uh, you open it up, and before you begin to uh, move through that text, you take in the whole page. Uh, it was important to me that as you open these pages, even visually, you would see that each writer's pages looked a little different. Uh, and that was important uh, not just because your experience should be distinct uh, with all of these, uh, but because I got burned a little bit uh, on defending Jacob. Uh, and defending Jacob, for those of you who read the print version of the book, you may remember that there's a lot of it is told in a, a transcript format. The, the, a lot of the book takes place in the grand jury. 
uh, in an investigative grand jury. And at the beginning, I explained now we're in the grand jury and these other questions and answers being asked and the Q&A parts of those uh, uh, chapters were told in a distinctive prompt that was meant to look like an actual trial transcript. And so after a while, uh, once the reader picked up on that device, I felt that I no longer had to say anymore, okay, now we're back in the grand jury room. I knew as soon as the reader saw that font and that look of the page, she would know we're back in the grand jury room. It turns out ebooks cannot reproduce book design that way. And so if you read the ebook version uh, of the book, you didn't get the benefit of the book design of those pages. Uh, and that was a problem because uh, about half of the readers of that book uh, and about 60% of the readers of the new book uh, are consuming it as an ebook. So if you are going to mess with syntax that way and, and you're trying to achieve the look of a certain page of text, you can't rely on book design to do that. You can't rely on fonts and spacing and everything that said because uh, the ebook will, will wipe it up. Uh, and ebooks are, are becoming increasingly important and it, it always puzzled me uh, why, why ebooks are so limited in this way because an ebook is really just a very long web page and web pages can, can be designed in, in lots of complex ways. Uh, in fact, they could do more than a printed book. Uh, but the, the format itself uh, doesn't allow it. So. Yeah. What about audiobooks? How do you feel about it? The question is, what about audiobooks? Um, I, I don't listen to a lot of audiobooks. <coughs> and again, I think it's a different um, medium. And so I try not to be too touchy about uh, how my books are read. Um, I will say that novels are not meant to be read aloud, generally. Uh, they're, they're meant, as poems are, to be uh, consumed in, in your head voice, uh, internally. And so I don't think about things like uh, breathing. I don't think in, in, a, in a book like this, it doesn't bother me to have a whole page of dialogue and no indicators like he said, she said, he said. Uh, the reader is able to follow along and if the, the dialogue is tight enough and well written enough, you'll know who's speaking uh, without those uh, little cheats. Uh, however, when you are reading the audio book, there's no way to signal uh, to the audience except by changing voices. So in this case, you have a novel that's told by four different narrators, each of whom has their own distinctive voice. But then when you go into dialogue, the poor actor has to act the parts of all of the participants in the conversation as filtered through the voice of this narrator, and it becomes impossible. So, so I have mixed feelings. You may have, yeah. uh, it's also, it's, there are, it, the, 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 there's a lot of variability. A lot of it relies on the skill of the reader, uh, whether an audiobook works or not. And there are some who are brilliant at it, uh, but it's, if you can have a good book that uh, gets a not so good narrator, and, and that, can, <clears throat> that can mess it up. So. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was very struck by that uh, moment you talked about that the uh, uh, obstetrician's office getting the call from your agent, uh, you know, and I'm wondering if there's a parallel to a little bit later on when you got something similar when you were called upon to do the pre-publication tour, which I didn't even realize existed either. Uh, and <laughs> what was that like? What was the recall? And what was it? I mean, you went from uh, being uh, the struggling writer, the person who had left a uh, uh, whole career in. Uh, uh, criminal law, and now all of a sudden you become a different person. What was that like? How did that happen? Unfortunately, you don't become a different person. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. Um, it's um, it had a 
professional implication uh, because my first two books were were beautifully reviewed, but they didn't sell, uh, if we're being perfectly honest. Uh, and so by the time Defending Jacob came out, my kids were probably 10 years old or so, uh, 10 and 8, something like that. And when the uh, when I saw the size of the advance uh, for the book that became Defending Jacob, uh, my immediate thought was, well, that's it. It's time to go back to being a lawyer. Um, I just can't live on that. And, and my agent uh, said, well, go ahead and write it, because you never know. Uh, so, so my feeling about this whole thing has been um, that I don't uh, allow the market to uh, be the, the judge and jury of my success. Um, I determine uh, whether I think the books work uh, or don't work. And so with Defending Jacob, I tried to be true to that uh, and not uh, feel vindicated uh, or uh, impressed by sales. Um, it's tempting after a book hits that way uh, to think that it's, uh, there was something distinctive about that book that separated it from the books that came before and the books that come after. But I, I promise you, uh, we could go outside and I'll show you all the parts <laughs> Uh, that are held together with scotch tape and string uh, mm -hmm. that, that bug me to this day. Uh, so uh, I've, I've tried to be true to that. Um, so the one thing that, that is good about a public success like that uh, is that your kids think you're cool. <laughs> you get about 30 seconds of being cool. So uh, I got to introduce my son to Chris Evans, and that, that got me one, one moment of not being the most dreadful human being on earth. Yeah. Yes. Um, but the way that you're talking, it, it, it yeah, seems like it takes a, a long time to write a book. That's, it, okay. it takes a long time. takes me a long time to write okay. a book. So it takes a long time to write a book, mm -hmm. and then um, it has to be um, edited or what, and then it's going to be printed and what, and then eventually it's going to come out. Period of time could be years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you've written a book, and you're going around wanting people to buy it. Have you started your book that will be next? I, uh, I have started the next book. Um, it's a very strange uh, process because it's very backloaded. It's 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 hard at the beginning. Uh, it's hard in the middle, and it's hard at the end also. But it's hard in a distinctive way at the beginning because uh, <coughs> because you don't know what you have, um, and that makes it hard to sit down to write when you don't know who the characters are and you don't know what the story is. Uh, by the end of the book, the pages are piling up quickly because you know exactly what's happening. You know what you need to get done, and you know who your characters are. Um, at the beginning, uh, uh, our, our friend Ian McEwen uh, has described it as, as like someone walking toward you through the mist. Uh, and the more you go with every sentence you lay down, uh, the person becomes a little clearer and a little clearer. But at the beginning, uh, you see almost nothing at all. Uh, and that makes it very hard at the beginning to start piling up pages and giving yourself that sense that you are moving toward uh, the finish. Uh, there's a lot of days at the beginning, most days, uh, where you come home with, with no more pages written than you, than you had when you got up in the morning. Uh, and that can be demoralizing. So, you know, the, the key is just to not quit and, and to keep on in the face of constant failure. Um, that's kind of the essence of it. Well, I'm going to say thank you for writing, because if you weren't writing, we all wouldn't have wonderful books to read. So thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. That's OK? It's quick. OK. I just want to tell you that I listened to the book, because I have to multitask when I bake. And it was the, and I'm very fussy about readers of the book. It was excellent. Thank you. The voices were were clear and appropriate to each of the characters, and the book kept me um, listening. Thank you. 
was very good. This was the first time I ever got involved with picking the beers, um, only because I felt like it was so important to this book that the voices suit the different narrators. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill, so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. And before you get up and buy his book, we just have a few words from Sylvia Belkin to close the event. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, as co-chair of this exciting evening, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, William Landay, for presenting the book. All that is mine, I carry with me. Many thanks to the Jewish Book Month Committee that has worked so diligently with Patty McSweeney and me and to our fantastic staff, most especially to Sarah Ewing, who has managed and directed this program from day one. You may purchase a copy of All That Is Mine I Carry With Me from Copper Dog Bookstore that is here for you tonight and uh, which author William Landay will be pleased to autograph for you. Our next Jewish Book Month event will be held on Sunday, October 29th at 11 a.m. and starts off with a delicious brunch prepared by Maria's Cafe to be followed by author Emily Franklin who will be presenting her deeply evocative and imaginative book, The Lioness of Boston, The Life of Isabella Stewart Gardner, the daring visionary who created an inimitable legacy in American art. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.